Okay. And so I think uh, we still have some participants filtering in, but we'll go ahead and get started. So today it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's Neurology Grand Rounds speaker, Dr. Kevin Staley. Dr. Staley is a professor of child neurology um, and chief of pediatric neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, Dr. Staley received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from Loyola Marymount University and his doctoral degree in medicine from the University of California, San Diego. He completed a residency in pediatric neurology at the University of California and an epilepsy research fellowship in cellular electrophysiology at Stanford. Um, Dr. Staley is uh, board certified in neurology with special qualifications in child neurology. Dr. Staley runs the MGH Pediatric Epilepsy Research Lab, where he is focused on developing new approaches to the treatment of epilepsy based on a clearer understanding of the necessary steps in seizure, seizure initiation and propagation. His lab studies neuronal ion transport and the spread of activity in neural networks, leading to the recently published trial of chloride transport inhibitor bumetanide for the treatment of neonatal seizures. Dr. Staley co-chaired the inaugural Gordon Conference on Mechanisms of Epilepsy, the 2013 NINDS Curing Epilepsy Conference, the American Epilepsy Society Investigator Workshop Committee, and the AES Research and Training Council. He's received an NINDS Javits Award and a Basic Scientist Research Recognition Award from the AES. Dr. Staley has published extensively in the fields of pediatric neurology and epilepsy. Despite his demanding schedule, Dr. Staley remains an invaluable research for the neurology trainees at MGH. He dedicates his time to resident education, passing along his clinical acumen as an attending on the consult service, a preceptor in resident clinic, and during multiple weekly conferences for which he's been named the MGH Pediatric Neurology Resident Tre Teacher of the Year Award on multiple occasions. He further serves as a mentor for his trainees, guiding and shaping their careers. It is my great honor and privilege to invite Dr. Staley to speak now about seizures after brain injury. Please direct any questions you may have to the Q&A um, and they will be answered at the conclusion of this talk. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, that was a great uh, presentation, uh, introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation to talk here. Uh, here's the code for attendance and I'll show that at the end of the uh, talk as well. Uh, let's make sure that this is going to work. There we go. Okay, so seizures after acute brain injury. You know, we're all pretty familiar with acute brain injuries, be they ischemic, uh, hemorrhagic, infectious, traumatic. And we're also uh, familiar with the fact that 10 to 20% of those acute brain injuries are associated with seizures in the first week after the injury. That uh, Those seizures are demoralizing for the families and sort of demoralizing for us too because we don't have uh, very good uh, treatments for them. Today, we're going to consider the possibility that the reason we haven't developed uh, good treatments for seizures after brain injury is we don't understand the pathophysiology very well. The canonical pathophysiology looks something like this. Bad things happen uh, to the brain, uh, leading to cellular ATP depletion, uh, ion pump failure, both sodium and calcium pumps, membrane depolarization, glutamate release, lots of extra action potentials, and that somehow leads to a seizure activity. The strengths of this story are that it's a logical progression. The weaknesses are that there's not much scientific evidence that this is the case. And we have pretty compelling clinical evidence that this isn't the case also. So ATP, uh, cellular ATP depletion to the point of pump failure happens in transient uh, ischemic attacks. It only takes seconds to minutes for that to occur in brain cells. But we never see a positive phenomenon in TIAs. We see you know, profound negative phenomena like aphasia or hemiparesis, but we, we don't see seizures. And so, you know, when you think about the difference between a TIA and a stroke, for example, uh, obviously a neuronal death is one uh, issue and the second is timing, how long the event lasts. So today we're gonna think about the possibility that there's something specific about neuronal death and the time after neuronal death that leads to these uh, seizures after brain injury. So first things first, I don't have any disclosures. I do wanna disclose a lot of uh, sweat equity in the people who've uh, done these experiments that I'm going to describe today in the clinical trials. It's great to be the idea man and the person who uh, thinks of uh, new experiments uh, and have all this uh, pool of great uh, faculty, junior faculty and uh, senior postdocs who actually do the work. 
The other uh, equity I should disclose is uh, an expensive breakable equipment, for which I'm indebted to the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Neurodegenerative Diseases, Brad and uh, Brian particularly. So let's uh, spend a couple slides on acute brain injury and think about the clinical phenomenology of seizures that follow. It was a middle cerebral artery stroke on the right side with diffusion changes. And if you look in the even numbered uh, leads on the right side, you see uh, a lot of epileptiform activity. Uh, seizures complicate seven to 15% of uh, strokes, uh, more common in hemorrhagic and cortical strokes. And uh, LTM shows about the same incidence of repetitive epileptiform activity. We look at infection, so there's a neonatal herpes encephalitis. We see a lot of uh, uh, left-sided cortical involvement and uh, left-sided odd-numbered electrode uh, seizure activity. Uh, seizures complicate about a quarter of uh, uh, CNS infections. Uh, if uh, you use just clinical manifestations, about twice that many if you do a long-term EEG monitoring and include seizures or uh, periodic uh, discharges. Uh, risk goes up with cortical involvement and uh, severity, and that's why uh, seizures in the state of infection <clears throat> a pretty significant negative uh, outcome uh, predictor uh, with an odds ratio of six for poor outcome. Uh, trauma is pretty heterogeneous, you know, multiple ways uh, to get seizures uh, in that setting, uh, contusions, uh, hematomas. This is a <clears throat> pioneering study by Paul Best, but from UCLA in 1999 when he did LTM in comatose patients, average Glasgow score seven, all treated with dilantin, uh, and saw a 20% overall incidence in seizures peaking on the first day and declining uh, thereafter. And we'll see this natural history repeated in other uh, forms of injury. All sorts of bad things were associated uh, with those seizures, increased ICP, increased brain lactate, increased extracellular glutamate, but those are associational studies. And so it's not clear if the seizures are the chicken or the, uh, and what's the egg, you know, the ICP uh, causal or, or caused by these uh, seizures. These are all electrographic uh, seizures. Uh, unfortunately, uh, perinatal uh, brain injury remains a, a robust, robust cause of uh, neonatal seizures. So about 85% of neonatal seizures are associated with acute brain injury. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy from parturitional problems is by far the most common. Um, but acute uh, stroke, hemorrhage, and infection are also uh, in the list. About 15% of neonatal seizures are caused by uh, genetic problems, and we won't focus on those today. Hypoxia ischemic encephalopathy is sufficiently common that people have used just that etiology to, to outline the natural history of seizures after brain injury. So here's a nice study from Ireland. These are uh, raster diagrams of seizures in 15 patients who were not cooled therapeutically, uh, were treated with phenobarbital, all of them. And you can see uh, that some patients had very few seizures and some patients had status epilepticus with the peak of seizures occurring a little bit after 24 hours. This is a study from CHOP. These patients were therapeutically cooled in this uh, light colored part of the uh, raster diagram. The dark colored part is where they were rewarmed. Uh, heavy bars are status epilepticus, lighter bars are frequent seizures and the thin bars uh, represent where they were monitored for uh, epilepsy. And if you put these two together, you would say there's a you know, pretty clear uh, sketch of natural history with seizures peaking just a little bit after 24 hours life. Uh, so the natural history really uh, impacts uh, therapeutic trials. So the trial neurology literature, unfortunately, is full of uh, people who concluded that they have uh, um, successfully treated neonatal seizures. And I'll, I think we'll point out that that's probably not the case. Probably they were confusing the natural history with therapeutic response. Uh, Mike Painter did a great job of looking at this in 1999, where he looked at the effect, the efficacy of phenobarbital and dilantin in a quantitative way for the first time. He didn't have access to full LTM in 1999, but he was able to show that in the baseline uh, uh, EEG, uh, if the seizures were increasing, there was only 30% response to therapy. The seizures were stable in the baseline period, about two thirds of patients responded. And if the seizures were decreasing, of course, uh, they, it was a great response. Overall, this is quoted as a 60% uh, response rate to phenobarbidilantin, but I think you can see that the people that we really want to treat are here in the beginning at the 30%, uh, and that's not a very good response. Renee Shellhouse, uh, in the era of LTM, uh, put together 534 patients in a voluntary uh, 
a multi center database and showed that patients with infrequent seizures responded really well to phenobarbital uh, or dilantin. And patients with stashed epileptic or, free, or frequent seizures had a very poor response, only about 10% or less. Uh, and this uh, issue will come up again at several points in the talk. So what happens if you don't think about the natural history very carefully? Um, here's a, just an example of a Keppra trial, uh, reasonable load and uh, maintenance after a perinatal brain injury. Seizures start on average at 12 hours. Uh, on average, they were treated for 36 hours with, with different medications before they were eligible for the uh, trial. Uh, after the Keppra load, a third of patients responded. Uh, within an hour, two thirds responded in uh, 24 hours and 86% by two days. So you might conclude, hey, this is a pretty good response. Maybe I'll try Keppra next time, benign medication. But if we superimpose the uh, Irish uh, natural history studies, these are patients who also pre-treated with phenobarbital, you see that Keppra really didn't impact the natural history at all. Uh, and that is uh, further emphasized uh, last year by the uh, first uh, randomized uh, controlled trial of Keppra, of any uh, uh, drug really for neonatal seizures uh, versus phenobarbital. And they showed that uh, with phenobarbital is the control and they showed that phenobarbital actually had uh, three times the efficacy of uh, Keppra. Now I just said in the last slide that, you know, phenobarbital uh, only worked in 10 to 30% of the severe cases. Uh, so how could it be three times better than uh, Keppra in this trial? Uh, these guys are randomized at the very first seizure so they captured a lot of these patients from the, uh, looking back at the shell house data, who are only gonna have a few seizures and in those cases, phenobarbital works pretty well. So uh, <clears throat> you have to think about the natural history and you have to include controls if you're gonna study a uh, problem like acute seizures, which have, has that unusual crescendo, decrescendo uh, natural history. Okay, so what have we just found out so far about the seizures after acute brain injury? We've talked about predisposing injuries, talked about the natural history, and we've talked about the response to therapy. Uh, next, we wanna talk about uh, some you know, questions that don't get addressed very often. Why do they happen at all? Why are they delayed for several hours after injury? Why do they stop after three to five days? And why don't they respond to therapy? To answer those questions, as we alluded to in the first slide, we're gonna look at how cell death, neuronal death, uh, impacts the seizure threshold and particularly how Ionic changes associated with neuronal death uh, alter uh, inhibitory GABA signaling and predispose to seizures. We'd like to answer the million dollar question, which is what outcome improve with effective therapy? And while I don't have the answer to that uh, question, we do have the results of recent trials that suggest that we are in a position to ask that question now. Okay, so uh, let's review a couple of things that we're all on the same page. Uh, first, neuronal death. Uh, bad things happen to neurons. Uh, Cytoplasm loads with calcium, it's pumped into mitochondria and eventually the mitochondria will fail under that calcium load. If the failure is complete, uh, mitochondria will stop working altogether, ATP levels drop and uh, cell swells and uh, ruptures releasing its contents into the extracellular space, which we'll see in a few slides is a, a disaster. Uh, neurons really want to prevent this type of uh, neuronal death and rather they'd have, uh, the brain would rather have cells undergo apoptosis where the membrane, outer membrane stays intact. Mitochondria are still somewhat functional. They release cytochrome C though uh, due to injury and that activates caspases and proteolytic cascade that dismantles the cells starting with the synthetic machinery and ending with phagocytosis by uh, microglia. So uh, when we look at pathological slides, we don't see a lot of evidence of necrosis, even if someone dies of a you know, catastrophic injury because necrosis is really fast and you don't see much uh, left after the cell is ruptured. Usually when we see a slide, it's got a lot of evidence of brain or neuronal death, it's uh, apoptotic death uh, with shrunken pycnotic uh, neurons and uh, staining with a multitude of uh, vital dyes that don't cross membranes very, intact membranes very well and staying for DNA. So uh, we uh, became interested in neuronal death uh, as a trigger for seizures about 10 years ago. And uh, in 2012, uh, stuck our fingers in the light socket and said that the hippocampal slice preparation, which is widely used to study synaptic physiology, was actually a great preparation for hypoxic ischemic uh, and traumatic uh, brain injury. Obviously there's a lot of 
uh, hypoxia and ischemia associated with uh, getting the, the brain out to slice it in the first place. And then, uh, you know, the neuron is sliced like a stack of bologna every 400 microns, and the neurons near the surface are badly injured. And we showed that using a transgenic protein called promillion. It's uh, comprised of a cyan fluorescent protein linked by 29 amino acids to a yellow fluorescent protein. So the cyan protein, fluorescent protein absorbs blue light, emits cyan light. The yellow fluorescent protein absorbs the cyan light, emits yellow light. And uh, the yellow fluorescent protein is quenched by uh, chloride. So if you take the ratio of yellow light to cyan light, uh, cyan fluorescent protein is insensitive to chloride. You can get a measure of the local chloride concentration that's independent of the concentration of the chloroform. So we used uh, mice transgenically expressing superchromillion, made slices out of those and showed that if you looked at the, this is the cut surface up here, the cut surface of the slice, the neurons were tremendously swollen and they had chloride concentrations that approximated the extracellular space so they had a complete uh, ion pump failure and were undergoing acute uh, necrosis. Neurons underneath here, underneath in the middle of the slice uh, were much better shaped. They had normal chloride, normal volumes. And if we cultured those uh, neurons, <coughs> cultured the slice, those neurons survived, sent out axons to reconnect with other neurons. Eventually, the slice develops electrographic post-traumatic epilepsy. Uh, now, one other uh, trick that you can do with transgenic uh, proteins was uh, pointed out by Steve Finkbeiner at UCSF about 15 years ago. He was studying Huntington's disease, and he noticed that neurons that die uh, that had been expressing fluorescent proteins, one of the very first things that he could see happen was that fluorescent uh, emission was extinguished. And so uh, this is longitudinal tracking of neuronal survival by transgenic fluorescent protein emission, which is a mouthful, but you can say what you see is what you get. So neurons that you can see that are persistently fluorescent um, are alive. And here's some uh, neurons expressing red fluorescent protein in organotypic slice. And you can see that they're healthy, you have normal uh, dendritic architecture, uh, and when they disappear, when they stop fluorescing, uh, that, that's a sign, an early sign of a neural death. Uh, here's a slice that was uh, expressed, neurons expressed cyan fluorescent protein, and it was co stained with propidium iodide, one of the markers for uh, apoptotic neural death. So, propidium iodide, when uh, neurons are advanced in the apoptotic pathway, uh, gets across, propidium iodide gets across the cytoplasmic membrane and the nuclear membrane and stains the nuclei, which you can see a bunch of nuclei seem to be floating in space because the neurons aren't expressing the fluorescent protein anymore, or the, it's not emitting it anyway. And there's no overlap between the propidium iodide staining and the cyan fluorescent protein staining. Same happens with the yellow fluorescent protein or green fluorescent protein. And Trevor Belena uh, counted up thousands of neurons and showed that basically there's no overlap uh, between uh, propidium iodide staining and fluorescent protein emission, which is great. So we can then use that property to track cells and see how long they survive in the hippocampal slice. So this is where Kyle did, tracking neurons over time to see how long they uh, survive in organotypic slice. And what we found is uh, that once fluorescence reached steady state, uh, we only lost about 1% of the neural population uh, per day from apoptosis. So a uh, final uh, trick that we uh, use fluorescent proteins for is uh, to uh, necrose single neurons. So we'd like to study necrosis and see what happens bionically in, uh, in the network, uh, but we have to pick models that are uh, tractable. So the slice wasn't a very tractable uh, model, but uh, two photon uh, barbecuing of individual neurons is. So remember a, a two photon microscope uh, uses uh, red photons that are focused in a very tight area uh, to a concentration where red photons can combine uh, to create blue photons and excite this cyan fluorescent protein. Outside of this tiny window where the photons are con concentrated, um, the red fluorescent proteins don't really uh, combine to make blue, uh, red uh, photons don't combine to make blue photons and so cyan fluorescent protein is not activated out here. There's no uh, heating, but here, if you turn up the laser power, you can actually cause the cyan fluorescent protein to absorb enough energy to heat the cytoplasm and rupture the uh, membrane of the neuron. Here's an experiment where we did that. So that these neurons are in the CA1 of the hippocampal uh, primal layer, uh, the hippocampus, and uh, we target a single uh, neuron. Uh, we uh, 
turn up the laser and ablate that uh, urine and you can see that that's a disaster to the neighbors. So the neighbors aren't heated by this. If you do this at subthreshold uh, radiation levels, there's no change in neighbors. This is really a consequence of this neuron rupturing and releasing its contents to the extracellular space. The contents of a cytoplasmic content of a neuron in addition to a lot of proteolytic enzymes includes uh, two millimolar glutamate, which is a very high concentration of glutamate. So if we look at this uh, neuron that was ruptured and we look at the chloride in the neurons around it as a function of time, we can see an early peak and you know, then a late uh, plateau in the chloride concentrations. If we look in space, we can see that the ruptured neuron was in the middle. And there's a lot of the neighbors are uh, badly uh, uh, affected by this uh, death of a single neuron. And it's not just the chloride concentration that's changed. You can see, and you saw from the movie, that there's a lot of extinction of fluorescence emission. So a lot of these neurons have died, and we can confirm that. The neighbors have died with uh, FLICA, which is, uh, stands for caspase, the uh, enzyme that initiates the proteolytic cascade of uh, apoptosis. Using glutamate antagonists, we can get rid of this early peak in uh, uh, chloride. Um, but as we found out the hard way with a lot of failed clinical trials, glutamate antagonists don't affect the fluorescent protein extinction uh, and they don't affect uh, the caspase activation. So they don't change the cell death of the neighbors. So uh, necrosis is a disaster for the neighbors of the neuron that died, and it's also a disaster for the network. So if we look at uh, slices, acute slices, uh, going back to that model of uh, necrosis, traumatic necrosis at the surface. You see that if we use a probe that has multiple electrodes in it, and we stick it into the depth of the slice. This is the cut surface up here. And here we can see that there's no activity at all. So what we get is uh, spreading depression in the region of uh, necrosis. We use another model of necrosis, in this case, oxygen glucose deprivation of an intact hippocampal slice preparation that wasn't traumatically prepared. Uh, and there's a, a control activity. If we look after oxygen glucose deprivation, we see a suppression of the activity. And eventually, at many hours later, a seizure uh, supervene just as in humans, but there's several hours of suppression first. So necrosis doesn't really seem, seems to be too severe to trigger seizures. Uh, it does, it kills neighbors and suppresses network activity rather than uh, triggers uh, seizures. We do see these seizures late, but it seems as though necrosis is probably best as an explanation for that delay, characteristic delay that we see uh, before seizures supervene after acute brain injury. So what about apoptosis? Here's an organic typic slice with a lot of propidium iodide stained uh, nuclei of neurons that are deep in the uh, process of apoptosis. And uh, they surround neurons that are perfectly happy, um, that have normal chloride uh, concentrations and normal morphology. So it seems as though apoptosis really is protective of the neighbors and doesn't seem to be causing much of a problem at the level of the neighbors of the apop apoptotic cells. So if necrosis doesn't cause seizures and apoptosis doesn't seem to be causing seizures, how do we end up with uh, seizures after acute injury? Uh, and this just shows a graph showing that uh, there's no effective uh, proximity. So let's take a closer look at apoptosis and see what happens after brain injury because it's sort of a unique situation. So a neuron decides to apoptose, uh, it takes irreversible steps, it activates caspases, disassembles its ribosomes so it can't possibly uh, survive, preserves mitochondria and ATP production and membrane ion transport though so it won't rupture and spill its guts and kill its neighbors. Uh, there's a progressive increase in membrane permeability, which is necessary to attract glia for phagocytosis. Uh, the neuron removes its connections, so dendrites and axons are, are destroyed to prevent network dysfunction. And the final step is microglial engulfment. So this works great. And in the previous slide, we saw it at the apoptosis rates that we see in organic different slides, about 1% per day. Uh, there's no effect on the uh, surrounding uh, neighbors. So this, this is an effective strategy. The problem is when you have brain injury and you have millions or billions of uh, neurons that die at once, then this microglial engulfment step becomes rate limiting and you get this, this phenomenon of delayed neuronal death, which is basically neurons stacking up for days, uh, hours to days in these other uh, stages of apoptosis. And what we're gonna look at today and test the hypothesis is that this progressive increase in membrane permeability is strongly pro-convulsant whereas the removal of network connections is anticonvulsant, and it's the 
balance between these two processes that determines that unique crescendo decrescendo uh, time course of uh, acute seizures after brain injury. So to assess these uh, possibilities, we're gonna need to uh, have a, uh, some sort of biomarker of apoptosis. Um, you know, we said that for us, since quenching is a great way to uh, see the start of apoptosis, and the problem is that then the neurons are invisible for the apoptotic for the rest of the period that they're apoptotic. So we can't use fluorescent proteins to study this thing very well. We can use uh, FLICA, so we know this as the fluorescent inhibitor of caspase activation that stains neurons with uh, caspase activation, but that's a little bit too uh, transient uh, to use. We found serendipitously that AM dyes, uh, which are uh, dyes that are esterified to a memory permeable moiety uh, to get into the cell, and then cytoplasmic esterase is supposed to break the, the ester bond and trap the ion, the organic dye inside the cell. It doesn't work very well, but it works great for neurons that are undergoing apoptosis. So what we see is uh, these neurons that stay with the AM dyes don't overlap at all with healthy for us uh, protein positive neurons. And they do overlap almost completely with uh, cells that uh, stain, whose membrane stain for an exon, uh, which uh, detects neurons with phosphatidylserine on the outer uh, membrane. This is a, something that happens early in apoptosis to attract uh, microglia to phagocytosis neuron. So if we use AM dyes, there's just a slide showing that the AM dye. Uh, uh, becomes positive as the neurons extinguish their uh, fluorescence at the start of apoptosis. Um, we can show that the AM dye stays uh, positive, uh, uh, stains the neurons all the way to the end of phagocytosis. So this is the movie, sort of a crude PowerPoint animation of an isolectin stain activated microglia uh, gobbling up this uh, SPFI positive neuron. And at 54 hours, you'll see the Pac-Man moment where the jaw is open and the neuron is uh, uh, engulfed and then digested. So uh, we can stain with SPFI all the way through uh, apoptosis. And so we can use SPFI AM dye staining as a way to uh, measure the time course. We see that on average, about uh, neurons spend three to four days in the apoptotic uh, cube. Uh, and with the time constant is actually five days and it can extend up to two weeks. So during that time, there's a progressive increase in membrane permeability. There's of course some positive uh, neurons in culture media, which has high potassium, and this is a normal uh, resting membrane potential for these neurons. AM dye positive neurons have a much more depolarized resting membrane potential. They also accumulate uh, sodium. Uh, AM positive dyes early in the course of apoptosis accumulate some sodium. By the time they also become propitium iodide positive, that sodium accumulation is much uh, greater. This is not due to mitochondrial failure because if we block mitochondrial respiration, we see a, a dramatic increase in the sodium concentration of these dyes in the uh, apoptosis. And similarly, it's not due to any sodium potassium ATPase failure because if we block sodium potassium ATPase, we see a nice increase in the uh, doubling in the uh, apoptotic uh, pathway. Sorry, let me just get rid of a reminder here. Okay, so, uh, so this really is a, a problem with uh, increased membrane permeability. So the mechanism of increased membrane permeability uh, during apoptosis is probably multifactorial, but a big factor has been uh, these uh, panexins, which are hem, you know, hemi gap junctions that get inserted into the membrane. Uh, here, uh, using a panexin uh, uh, stain, uh, Fatima Bahari was able to show that uh, there's baseline panexin staining in organotypic slice based on the neurons that were injured during slicing. But if you subject this organotypic slice to oxygen glucose deprivation, you see a new crop of neurons that are going apoptosis and staining with uh, panexins. You can see the same thing in in vivo trauma. So we collaborated with Tina Duhame and Beth Bartel in the neurosurgery department. They have a nice uh, controlled cortical impact model of uh, uh, brain in, traumatic brain injury. And we can see in the uh, uh, impacted a hemisphere, there are a lot of neurons, these brown uh, staining neurons that uh, stain for panexin. This is counter staining with h &E. And this is just a graphical representation of the fact that there's a lot of panexin positive neurons in the injured hemisphere. So why do we care about uh, permeability? Why is it important? Well, you know, changes in memory and permeability is how uh, neurons 
communicate and transduce information. So if we have a GABA receptor, for example, that operates a chloride channel, if we open that channel, uh, chloride will flow from the extracellular space where chloride concentration is high to the intracellular space where it's low, and will continue to diffuse until charge accumulation, because chloride is negatively charged, uh, rebuffs further diffusion. And that will happen at a membrane potential of about minus 120 millivolts. So there's charge accumulation that prevents further diffusion. It doesn't, charge accumulation only requires a few femtomoles of uh, chloride to diffuse. So there's nearly no change in the overall uh, chloride concentration in this situation. But if we add a second uh, conductance, say a cationic conductance, that will short circuit any uh, uh, charge accumulation because if the negative charge accumulation occurs as a consequence of uh, chloride diffusion, then potassium will just diffuse over because uh, it's positively charged and cancel out that uh, charge accumulation. So under these conditions, you get a lot of uh, ion movement and uh, concentrations of the ions actually change. In fact, uh, you now see that the potassium and the chloride concentration gradients are, are the same. They're just mirror images of each other because of the charge difference. So this is what neurons use to move a, a lot of uh, uh, ions. It's what they use to co-transport chloride. They add one more uh, step of sophistication that they link the potassium and the chloride together. So you move one anion and one cation at a time. So there's no net change in the uh, charge across the uh, membrane. Neurons use two uh, transporters. One's called KCC2, which you see a stain in the membrane of this neuron, and the other is called NKCC1, stain in the membrane of this neuron. KCC2 is a potassium chloride co-transporter. It has the equilibrium conditions that we saw on the previous slide, and uh, that's with an intracellular chloride about five millimeter. NKCC1 uh, includes a sodium uh, permeability, uh, and so it has a much that is a big inward gradient for sodium. So it has a much different uh, equilibrium point for chloride, about 60 millimolar. So there are neurons that extend just for KCC2 or just for NKCC1, but there's neurons that have both. And you wonder how that could happen because KCC2 would be pumping chloride out and NKCC1 would be pumping chloride in. That seems to be very, a short circuit, a chloride short circuit, and very energy insufficient, right? yeah, in, inefficient. So how does that, uh, Happen. Um, I think Nagar Ramadi just published a really nice paper with Norm Moyle this uh, month in January SI that sort of uh, solves that problem. They show that neural cytoplasmic chloride isn't uniform across uh, the cell. It's actually very uh, heterogeneous, and there are uh, areas that we would call chloride microdomains. So if we use two photon microscopy and a high uh, sensitivity version of chromelium called superchromelium to look at the chloride concentration in dendrites, we can see that there are areas of very low chloride concentration. Uh, abutting uh, areas of very high chloride concentration where the warmer colors are. So a GABA receptor that abuts this cool uh, area or the low chloride concentration would hyperpolarize in the membrane and a GABA receptor that was uh, abutting this uh, warm area where the chloride is high, if it opened that chloride channel, it would actually depolarize the membrane. And Nega showed nicely that it, individual inner neurons have unique actions on the, on the membrane potential of postsynaptic pyramidal cells. A really nice insight into information processing and information storage in the dendrites of uh, neurons based on this heterogeneity. Same thing happens in pyramidal cells. There's a low chloride area immediately abutting a high chloride area. You might say, well, why doesn't the chloride flow from the high chloride area into the low chloride area? And the reason is there's a bunch of other anions in this low chloride area. They're just not chloride. Um, now here's a in vivo picture of an inner neuron with the same microdomains. What happens is there's all these negatively charged polymers in inner neuron, uh, you know, actin, tubulin, for example, that have charge densities that are negative and just as high as uh, chloride. And so chloride is not going to be where there's a lot of actin and tubulin. Here's just a picture, this is not a neuron, I think it's an HEK cell, but it just shows um, they did serial staining for 40 different, 41 different proteins. It just shows the heterogeneity of protein distribution across the cell. And so if some of these proteins are negatively charged, you can imagine that there'd be a mirror image of the uh, distribution of mobile uh, chloride ions uh, in the cytoplasm. We just look at actin and tubulin uh, carrying normal stain. Uh, these dendrites for actin and tubulin, you can see that they're uh, you know, uh, <coughs> homogeneously distributed across these uh, uh, dendrites, and so there'll be a matching uh, inhomogeneous uh, distribution of chloride. 
Okay, so that solves that inhomogeneous distribution of chloride solves our transport problem. KCC2 can be happily in equilibrium with low chloride areas of the uh, neuron, the areas that we uh, pseudo colored blue in those previous slides. And NKCC1 can be happily in equilibrium with the high chloride area uh, elements of the uh, neuron. The problem happens when the injured neuron and you start sticking pinexin pores willy nilly into the uh, membrane. The pinexin is permeable to everything sodium, potassium, chloride, water. And so it's gonna cause the, high, the low chloride areas to become high chloride. So GABA receptors that used to hyperpolarize the membrane when they opened are now going to depolarize the membrane when they open. And that's a strongly broken Wilson problem. Um, and it just shows that the equilibrium potential. So does chloride accumulation happen after injury? Uh, yes, uh, here is some pseudo colored uh, hippocampal neurons uh, uh, injured by oxyglucose deprivation. You can see that the chloride uh, using the pseudo color bar is increased. This is a mild uh, injury, so the neurons didn't lose their uh, fluorescence emission. Panama Bahari showed that uh, the median uh, chloride concentration of reverse potential for GABA goes up quite a bit. So at this point, you'd be activating uh, low threshold calcium uh, channels and removing the magnesium block in the A receptor. And there are in here neurons which are. Uh, in which uh, GABA would be much more strongly depolarizing. Now, if you look at trauma, we said previously, of course, using our popular uh, slice model that there is, uh, uh, that neurons that are acutely traumatized uh, accumulate chloride. Um, on the basis of this swelling and chloride accumulation, we hypothesized that the diffusion changes that we see after brain injury are due to swelling of neurons and uh, uh, collapse of the extracellular space where the diffusion signal originates and that the diffusion changes and cerebral edema and seizures are all linked by this uh, problem with the uh, chloride homeostasis across these pathologically permeable membranes. Um, to prove that, I guess we could have done MRI of brain slices, but that would have been hard and not very compelling. So instead, we collaborated with uh, Tina Behem and Beth Bartel again on piglet uh, head trauma studies. And this is a DOD uh, Department of Defense funded uh, project. You can see some of the challenges. This is actually a mini pig. Uh, this is Beth Bartel getting ready to uh, do some control cortical impact experiments. This is a microscope that uh, Kyle Lillis built to uh, accommodate these large heads. I think this is the largest brain that's ever been imaged with two photon microscopy. Uh, Kieran and Owen Moyle uh, made an AAV vector uh, using the new uh, high sensitivity version of chromillion so we could image uh, chloride successfully in the brain. This is a demonstration in the hippocampus. So uh, chloride accumulates in neurons injured by trauma um, in vivo. So here are the uh, burr holes made for the controlled cortical impact in the pig brain. Here is the swelling underlying the uh, uh, controlled cortical impact. Here we can circle it in true radiologist fashion. Um, we don't have pretty pictures of diffusion weighted imaging yet in the pig like we do in human, but you can see that the uh, mean diffusivity uh, uh, significantly decreased uh, following injury. So we're still working on the protocols to get that image to look like. But the cool thing is that we were able to show for the first time in vivo, or Kyle and uh, Beth Bartel uh, were able to show for the first time in vivo that chloride accumulates in this area of uh, diffusion decrease and uh, brain swelling. So here's a pre uh, treatment based on chloride images uh, get, uh, after immediately after injury, we've seen neurons start to accumulate chloride and that continues for hours later. Here's the, just the plot of uh, injury, pre-injury, it should be pre-injury, uh, one hour post-injury, four hours uh, post-injury. So a dramatic increase in the chloride to go along with that uh, uh, brain swelling we saw on T1 rated images and the reduced diffusion we saw on T2 rated images. So this is the first time we've been able to, to correlate these things uh, together and show that chloride accumulation in neurons really does uh, coincide with the uh, increase, uh, with the diffusion changes and uh, uh, this brain swelling. So if injured neurons undergo apoptosis uh, and accumulate chloride, they can gather responses to excitatory. Um, do they do that before they lose their dendrites and axons or, or after? So if they do it after they lose the dendrites and axons, it doesn't really matter very much. Melodia showed a few years ago that damaged, uh, that the, ax, the dendrites have damaged neurons have high chloride and that the neurons um, with the highest chloride um, have the shortest dendrites. So those uh, dendrites have already been uh, starting to be retracted. So there's a race between, if you're thinking about this as an etiology procedure, it's between 
of chloride accumulation and retraction of synapses and dendrites. And so the question really is, do neurons undergoing apoptosis participate in seizures? So this is a fascinating series of experiments by Melanie Malley uh, that she just started last summer. So she used turbo RP uh, expression to uh, look at cell survival. Um, she used GCAMP, which only becomes fluorescent when the calcium level of a cell increases to look for seizure activity. And then she uh, used uh, organotypic slices that subjected to oxygen glucose deprivation, uh, relatively mild oxygen glucose deprivation because she didn't want to extinguish the um, pro uh, flux of protein emission right away. And so she saw that after the oxygen glucose deprivation, a seizure started an hour later in, in the slice. Uh, in the, and she could see uh, the calcium transients, synchronous calcium transients in the neurons that survived. But the fascinating thing was that in the neurons that were destined to die in the next 24 hours after oxygen glucose deprivation, these guys were also participating in the seizures. And so were neurons that weren't uh, going to, to extinguish the fluorescent protein uh, for more than 24 hours. So these are neurons that, if they're in the apoptotic pathway, must be really, really early in the apoptotic pathway. And she continued to follow these neurons over several weeks. She got this really interesting uh, result, which is here's the, the baseline uh, uh, neural apoptosis rate, you know, a little bit more than 1% uh, per day in this population because they were getting uh, subjected to two photon microscopy repeatedly. But we could see that the rate of uh, apoptosis in the neurons and the slices that had undergone oxygen glucose deprivation was three or four times the baseline. So this was ongoing. A neuronal death in these seizing slices after injury. Uh, and so we have the sustained excess of initiation of apoptosis. So this is not really that delayed neuronal death where neurons pile up and might we can't eat them. This is sustained uh, initiation of apoptosis after injury. And so the question is, would that increased uh, cell death be uh, ameliorated by stopping seizures? The question is, how do we stop the seizures after acute brain injury? We've been arguing for a decade and a half uh, that, that keeping chloride out of neurons is the best way to do that. And that uh, is a synergistic with hormonic compulsions that are predicated on a normal chloride uh, transmembrane uh, gradient. So we often use the uh, fumetonide. Fumetonide blocks NKCC1, our chloride accumulation. And uh, here you can see it uh, uh, blocks the accumulation of chloride after injury. You might think, well, why not use panexins? Uh, panexin blockers are clinically available like naphloquin. Um, it doesn't work uh, quite as well. Um, it, it blunts the chloride accumulation, but it doesn't stop it. And worse, if we go back to the uh, single neuron uh, necrosis model that we used, uh, uh, be, that we saw previously, if we block panexins, we see a massive extinction of fluorescent proteins. So all the neurons in this area die. And if we use flicostain, we can see that these neurons really are dead. They've activated caspases and are, and are apoptosing. So uh, you've got to be careful about how you uh, block chloride entry, but chloride en blocking chloride entry is a intriguing uh, neuroprotective strategy. Uh, it's been known for many decades uh, since uh, Mark Goldberg and Janice Troy did this at the height of the uh, glutamate toxicity craze in uh, culture neurons. Here's a low chloride uh, media. So uh, it prevents, of course, any chloride entry into the cells because there's no chloride in the media, very little. It also, though, prevents the extinction of uh, fluorescent emission, and it decreases dramatically the uh, activation of caspase in these neurons. So there's something about uh, inhibiting, uh, low chlor uh, inhibiting chloride entry into neurons that's uh, strongly neuroprotective. And how can we do that in vivo? Well, it turns out that we can prevent chloride influx across the blood-brain barrier. So for the, in order for the brain to swell, it needs to get salt water in there somehow, and that uh, you know, salt is really a uh, chloride salt. And uh, we can prevent chloride flux, uh, influx in the brain across the blood-brain barrier by blocking NKCC1. This was shown by uh, Mark O'Donnell in 2004. There are a lot of studies showing that if you do transient um, arterial obstruction, so you get a nice stroke and then you reperfuse, so you uh, reopen the artery, that fumetonide decreases the demon and improves outcome. Same with trauma, we have open vessels. Same with seizures, where you induce it with convulsions where the uh, vessels are open. Uh, same with hypoxia ischemic injury. Bumetonide improves outcome. The places where bumetonide doesn't work is if you do a stroke and you leave the vessel occluded, so there's no 
impact of eumetanide at the blood-brain barrier. And similarly, if you damage the blood-brain barrier so badly that the chloride gets across independently of NKCC1, then eumetanide is ineffective. So it looks like eumetanide would be a great thing to try in neonatal seizures. We initiated a trial in 2009. There was a trial uh, that was started uh, in Europe at the same time, a smaller, uh, faster trial with no control group, um, but they ran into uh, over toxicity problems. Uh, several uh, babies had uh, loss, had hearing loss and they weren't sure if it was met or, night or not. So after 14 patients, they stopped the trial and uh, got a paper in Lancet Neurology saying, well, we you know, it could be over toxic and we don't think it worked anyway. Uh, so we're stopping the trial. People wrote back in and said, well, you know, uh, a lot of your patients didn't have any seizures during the baseline, the two hour baseline before seizures. Five of the 14 patients didn't have any seizures. And you included those as bumetanide failures, but you probably should have just thrown them out since they didn't, they weren't seizing. And uh, so the NEMO investigators wrote back and said, we promise to be with conclusions that further clinical studies of bumetanide are warranted, uh, which wasn't easy for us to read because we were right in the middle of our uh, bumetanide trial. I think you can see that if you look over here, there's a lot more seizure activity before bumetanide than after bumetanide, but we don't know if that's just a reflection of the natural history, this crescendo or decrescendo pattern because they didn't have a control. So Janet Soule uh, at Children's Hospital and I collaborated to, uh, and I think Francis Jensen was involved in planning this as well. Um, I would propose uh, Janet for canonization uh, for this trial. You know, we think of, uh, Columbus as a, a exemplary of, of persistence. You know, we sailed across the Atlantic and was outside of land for 36 days before he rediscovered America. Uh, and in uh, you know, comparison, the Bumetanide trial took uh, 15 years, <laughs> a really long time. And Janet was her persistent to make this thing happen. Uh, so we took at-risk neonates. We did EEG monitoring um, because a lot of uh, EEGs, a lot of seizures are electrographic only in this uh, situation. If they had seizures, they got treated standard of care, which is phenobarbital. If they failed the phenobarbital, then they got randomized to more phenobarbital, which is standard of care, or more phenobarbital with menai. Now remember, this is where the uh, Kepra trial randomized, right at the very first seizure, where we randomized after um, phenobarbital failure. So we selected out those people who were in that 10% who had uh, frequent, more frequent seizures and weren't doing very well. So it took us longer to complete our trial because we studied a subpopulation um, that did poorly with mean barbital. So this paper finally got published in uh, uh, February this year. Here's all the patients, um, some patients in status epilepticus and a lot uh, had more mild seizures, but all these had failed mean barbital. It turned out that a lot of the mild, milder cases uh, were uh, in the placebo group and a lot of the more severe cases were metanide group. And that's shown here. So this is the baseline seizure severity uh, broken down by the three uh, treatment groups that we had. This is the maximum renal dose of bumetanide, and these are higher doses of bumetanide that we uh, tested. The highest uh, dose of bumetanide was tested, it turned out, in patients who had really, really bad seizures. Uh, but it turned out that those patients responded uh, nicely. So this is the change in seizure frequency baseline versus after bumetanide and the patients with the most seizures had the biggest response. This is shown per patient here. So it wasn't just an outlier that caused that. But this is the slope of the um, patients who were treated with bumetanide, uh, total seizure burden. So severity of their uh, it, seizure uh, diathesis versus response to bumetanide. And so the more severe patients responded better uh, to bumetanide, whereas uh, with phenobarbital, as we've seen in the Painter study and the Shaw study, uh, the opposite was true. So the chance that these slopes are the uh, same is uh, uh, 80,000. Now, some people have said, well, this is just regression to the mean. You know, people with a lot of seizures are gonna have uh, less seizures uh, and that's uh, to be expected, but that's not what happens in the neonatal seizures. So people with a lot of seizures keep having a lot of seizures. And so this was remarkably different than what we could expect to see with standard therapy. Uh, we're not sure if we got the dose right. Um, we probably didn't. Um, the, if you look at the dose response curve, it looks like it peaks at a milligram per kilo and we stopped at 0.3 milligrams per kilo. So let me repeat this. There's no evidence of bumetanide tox ototoxicity in animals, although it does enhance aminoglycoside ototoxicity. And sometimes babies are treated with aminoglycosides. So let's make sure they don't do that. 
but we don't know the optimal dose and we don't know the best timing either. Collodia has shown recently and has an R1 application and showed that bumetanide given early would prevent more uh, chloride accumulation uh, and it works better than bumetanide given late. And that's just shown here, delay in bumetanide therapy versus um, uh, effect on uh, seizures is uh, much better uh, given early. So in conclusion, uh, why do seizures happen? Um, we think that the membrane permeability increases after injury, depolarizing neurons in uh, the closer action potential threshold emitting chloride, which makes the epic excitatory. Why are they delayed for several hours after injury? We have indirect evidence that that's due to resolution of brain depression, but it's also the time needed for the apoptotic uh, membrane, neurons membrane permeability increase and for them to accumulate chloride to the point that GABA becomes excitatory. Or they stop after three to five days, damage neurons lose their processes and network connections and their phagocytomes. Why don't they why don't these seizures respond to therapy? Well, anticonvulsants work by increasing the GABA conductance. And if GABA currents are excitatory, that's not going to be a very strong anticonvulsant effect. So we need to start with neurons of chloride, most likely at the blood-brain barrier. NKCC1 looks like it's promising, phenexin's less so, but there are lots of other. Uh, uh, chloride pathways that we need to investigate and potentially block. So future directions, we want to look at the dose and timing of bumetanide in a, another trial. Um, we want to speed up uh, dendritic or synaptic pruning if possible and find and block other uh, chloride leaks. So there's the uh, SMS code in case you missed it at the beginning. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Staley, um, for that very interesting talk. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in in the chat, and, and I encourage anyone who has questions to um, enter them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so the first question, uh, is there a role for chloride modulation in treatment of seizures in the setting of brain injury in older children or adults? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I, I think that uh, if, I could go back, I won't try to, to the slide that showed the efficacy of bumetanide uh, in uh, stroke models and trauma models and hypoxia ischemia models uh, and induced seizure models. Most of those trials were done in adult animals. So I think that, yeah, this, um, that the way that, it, that uh, chloride gets across the blood brain barrier is the same in uh, neonates and adults. The expression of NKCC1 in neurons is heavier in uh, neonates versus adults, but that's probably not where the locus of NKCC1 uh, action, anticonvulsant action in vivo. It's probably at the uh, blood brain barrier. And, and so that should be equally effective in adults and kids. All right, um, and a question from Dr. Cole. Uh, as always, great talk. Do you think bumetanide has a uniform effect on intracellular chloride or does it selectively change the microcompartment distribution of chloride? Yeah, that's a great question, Andy. Um, trying to think if we have done that experiment or not. We did uh, do that experiment and uh, we saw uh, that bumetanide in undamaged neurons did not cause much of a difference in the uh, distribution of uh, chloride, which would be expected if all those different pockets were all in equilibrium with each other. So you could take out either KCC2 or KCC1 and maintain the uh, relative distribution of immobile anions and therefore the distribution of mobile anions chloride. Now, if you added, uh, it would be interesting to extend that, uh, one, that inquiry one step further and say, well, what if we inserted connections into the membrane would be the effect on the distribution of chloride in that situation. Um, and we've only done that, you know, the experiments I showed you were only looking at the soma, soma they were with the low sensitivity uh, a version of chromillion. And so we just saw bulk changes. We didn't uh, split it up into smaller changes, but it would be very interesting to see now uh, what happened to the uh, distribution of chloride. I, I would predict that we'd see a bigger effect in the lower chloride areas when, when connections were inserted. All right, um, and Dr. Gompertz asked, uh, that was fantastic. Kevin, can you please comment on whether there is a differential loss over time of interneurons versus glutamer uh, glutamergic cells in these settings that could contribute to the dynamics of seizures after injury? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And we've looked really, we, uh, you know, Imperial We, uh, Kyle Lillis and uh, Lauren Lau have looked really hard at, at that question. Uh, and we have not seen uh, a loss of uh, interneurons uh, specifically uh, or in, in excess of pyramidal cells. Now, that, that doesn't mean that um, every interneuron is equally as important in preventing uh, network seizures. They might be doing something important, but not preventing uh, seizures. And so it's possible that there's a subpopulation of interneurons that are lost that are important. We've only looked at, at uh, neurons that are labeled DLX, so we haven't looked at specific subpopulations of interneurons that we need to do that. We think that probably it's the recurrent um, excitatory connections uh, from pyramidal cells onto neighbors and themselves that are triggering seizures and uh, post-traumatic epilepsy. But um, that interneuron question uh, remains interesting. We need to continue to pursue it. Um, and Dr. Rosenthal asks, is there a change in seizure propagation physiology over development? So uh, that's a great question. Um, I, generally, uh, the answer I think would be yes. You know, in the old days, we used to um, slow down the EEG paper speed um, by half uh, when we were recording uh, neonatal seizures so that uh, everything would look sharper. <laughs> <laughs> because the propagation speed was lower. The spikes were, were fatter and slower. And there really weren't spikes, they're just sharp waves. Uh, and sometimes it, uh, the ectal discharges didn't even qualify as sharp waves. That'd probably be something for Andy to talk about. Uh, rather than me, it's been a long time since I've looked at those in that level of detail. Uh, but overall, uh, yeah, there's less myelinated fibers. Uh, and myelination is less complete in uh, uh, the developing brain. So seizures propagate. Uh, more slowly uh, in the developing brain and sometimes don't propagate at all. Lots of neonatal seizures, uh, it's hard to tell from artifact because their distribution is so tiny. It could be a single electrode. You're not really sure if it's an electrode artifact or, or a seizure. And you look back at those classic studies from the 30s of uh, dendritic branching in the, in the neocortex. And you know, at, at birth to two, three months of age, it just looks like a bunch of saplings uh, in a forest, they don't have any branches at all. And then over the first two years of life, you know, there's much more um, lateral spread of connections between uh, neurons in the cortex and that facilitates the spread of seizures over that period of time. And, and Dr. Cole asks, uh, are you using bumetanide clinically at this point? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> So, you know, that's a good question. You know, in true Neuronex fashion, I probably should have said uh, that we had a strong efficacy signal. I think that's the, the, the correct term to use for a phase two trial, which by definition is underpowered to prove efficacy. Um, and I would really, I think, I probably, uh, I might, I have used it in the past in desperation when people have failed uh, uh, anesthetic concentrations and anticonvulsants. Um, but I would probably reserve it till then and until uh, we do the, uh, the phase three trial, uh, which would probably take a couple hundred patients. Uh, but I look forward to doing that. I look forward to giving bumetanide in the delivery room if I can convince Janet Soul that that's a safe thing to do because that would require giving bumetanide to patients who might not be destined to have seizures but are at high risk. Um, but I think if we gave it early, we would see a really profound uh, anticonvulsant effect. That's the really intriguing data that I showed from Apollodia at the very end of the talk. So uh, soon, but not uh, not yet. Uh, hopefully, we can convince Neuronex to, to fund a, uh, uh, a multi-center trial because uh, for sure I am not doing that uh, uh, as a Boston collaborative again. I don't have another 15 years <laughs> to invest in that kind of trial. Um, and then if you have a minute, one last question from Dr. Walker um, regarding the Belena model of necrotic uh, progression. Is this specific to cortical neurons or are deep gray structures similarly affected? Yeah, that's a great question, Missy. I don't know. Um, I, it would be great to do. Uh, we haven't done it, um, um, but it'd be easy to make cultures of neocortex or, or subcortical structures. And see, I would expect that they would all have a similar um, responses, but I guess I don't know that. And it, it never occurred to me to, to check. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, right. Thank you so much, Dr. Staley. Thanks. Bye-bye.